Hi everyone, I'm going to play Rock Slayer. Um, I don't want to spoil any details uh, of the quest, and that means I'm going to change some of the tiles. I will slightly modify the map. I'm going to play a game with only one hero, Aki, and I'm going to use the Dwarven Mercenary again. With the money I got in my previous quest, I was able to heal my Dwarf but I couldn't recover the fortune point that Aki had spent in uh, the previous quest. I have been able to buy some new equipment. It's not that much, but at least I'm a bit stronger than I was in the previous quest. Even though it's going to be a very difficult quest uh, because I'm playing it with only one hero. The first thing we must do is prepare the Dark Player's budget. In this case, Aki is worth 13 BP. Uh, 10 uh, is the uh, value points of my hero, but then 3 extra VPs for my equipment. To that, I must add 4 VPs for my mercenary. Well, that makes a total of 17 VP, which is going to be the budget the Dark Player is going to have during this mission. First of all, the Dark Player must pay the price of the leader, and according to the quest, the leader is a bandit boss. The bandit boss is worth 5 points, so I subtract them from my budget, which means I'm left with 12 points for the dark player. Next, we have to build uh, the dark player's deck. We have removed a number of cards according to the special rules of the quest. So we have removed a number of uh, traps and obstacles which are not going to be here in this quest and after doing that we're going to build the deck we have set apart this card lock door we have to keep it apart which means that sometime across the mission it will come up at the same time, here we have uh, the three decks, powers, obstacles, and encounters. So we're going to create the, the different decks. We take the obstacle card, but well, before taking the obstacle card, we're going to remove three cards from these encounters there. Uh, ambush, reinforcements, and thief. We will see later why we do this. When you're playing with an artificial dark player, the dark player's deck is built in a slightly different way from the way you do it with a human dark player. Now I take the obstacle deck, we shuffle the cards, and we're going to draw six cards per hero. Since we're playing with only one hero, we're going to draw six cards. But now we must add one thief and one ambush cards from the ones we had set apart. We shuffle the cards again. Now we must place the deck in the right place. You must have a look at the reserve point counter. It tells you where you must place each deck so you don't make any mistakes. If you see the counter, here you got the encounter deck. Here you got the obstacle and the power decks.
Now we're going to build the power deck. Again, we're going to draw five cards per hero. Since we're playing with only one hero, that means five cards. Now, we're going to include in this deck one reinforcement card. If we were playing with two or more heroes, we would include two, the two reinforcement cards we had left apart. We place the power deck in the right place. And finally, we're going to build the encounter card, the encounter deck. We're going to draw as many cards as the BP of the group of heroes divided by 10, always rounding up. So in this case, we're going to take only two encounter cards, and that's it. Only two encounter cards. And now we have finished the setup uh, of the game. We have built the three decks the artificial dark player is going to use, and we're going to start player. There is only one thing left that we must do, and it is take the tokens for the achievement points. And we have them here ready next to the achievement point counter. These achievement points are going to be quite important because if the heroes manage to get more achievement points than the dark player, they will get experience at the end of the mission that they will turn into development points. And that means they will be able to grow and improve as uh, heroes. So we're going to start now, but I'm going to use the smartphone app and here we have the map. So we check which is the tile that we're going to need. We can see it here. So we search for it. It is this one. You must remember that both on the smartphone app and in the quest book, you have a summary of all the tiles you're going to need for the quest so that you can have them ready in advance. So we place the tile in the correct way and this is going to be our starting point and we're also going to place an open door. So we're going to access the scenario through this point. We must place another door here according to the description we have on our smartphone app. And we begin with the first turn of the heroes. I'm going to activate the door first and he's going to move within his own safety zone in order to avoid any traps. Next comes Aki. She's, she's going to move within the dwarf's safety zone too, so she doesn't trigger any traps. That's the end of the hero's first turn. Uh, first turn for the dark player, who does nothing but simply gets one achievement point. Now, a new turn for the heroes. Aki is going to move to the door and try to open it. We must roll the scenario die and see if we get a result of a trap. No, no trap result. We were lucky. So the door simply opens. We flip it and well, here you can see that these bits have two different sides, one with the door closed, one with the door open. And now we're going to reveal which is the next section. In order to do so, we simply click on the door, we click on open and the next section is revealed. If we click here to see what it is, we will see that it is a, an element of furniture which is called barrels and boxes. So we place the tile in the right position. 
Using the app as a guide, we can see that the room has a large door. We place it in the right place. And then it also has a small door, which comes here. And then we have the furniture element, barrels and boxes that we must place here. You have a full description of all the elements that appear in the quest in the description in the quest book, campaign and quest book, okay? But you should be careful not to read those things uh, in red shading. Uh, when you are using the smartphone app, uh, the smartphone app helps you not to reveal what are the different elements you're going to find during the quest. So we always advise you to use the smartphone app and discover all the elements, the special elements and furniture as you rebuild them. Otherwise, you will probably read about something that you are supposed to find uh, maybe um, three or four sections away. And it is something that you should really not know. Okay, so I have already activated Aki. She has opened the door. So her, her activation is finished. Now I'm going to activate my dwarf. And I think I'm going to run because he's so slow, you know. Three, four, five, six, and I move my dwarf here. Remember that he is equipped with a battle axe. It is a two-handed weapon and he's wearing chainmail too. Now it is the turn for the dark player. He gets one more achievement point. It's the hero's turn again. I'm going to move Aki here so she can check the barrels and boxes. We must take the furniture card. Here it is. Barrels and boxes. And the card says that we must roll five dice and for every result of six we will get one coin. If we get two or more results of six, we will get a pack of provisions too. But no, that's not the case. And we find absolutely nothing. So I have spent my action in searching this furniture. And I finished my turn here. One more achievement point for the dark player. So it's the hero's turn again. I move Aki to this large door and I try to open it. And no trap is activated so i open the door let's check the uh, smartphone app and see what we find and what we find is a large room that means that finding enemies in there because it is a large room is going to be much more likely but anyway We locate the right tile and we place it in the right position. It has a fireplace and a dining room. There is also a door at the end of the room. So we place it there. And that is it. So now we have just revealed a new section and that means we must roll this in area die to see if there are enemies in that room. Whenever you reveal a new section, you must roll this in area die 
And if you get a result of encounter, enemies will be spawned. So we roll the dice. We were lucky, no enemies. But since we have just revealed a large room, the rule says that whenever you reveal a large room, one extra encounter card must be drawn. That means that whenever you reveal a large room, at least one encounter card is going to be played. So I draw one card and I get a special creature card. Now we must check the bestiary. We must check the creature spawn table in the bandit section. We will roll one die and we will add a plus one for every 30 VPs we're playing with. We get a five and what we get is an outlaw sorcerer. When we spawn a sorcerer, the initiative is very important. If we win the initiative, we could easily destroy him. But if it is the sorcerer who wins the initiative, things are going to get really tough because I can't spell any spells he casts against us. The card says that if the creature is spawned alone, you must roll the scenario die again to see if a new encounter card is drawn. This is important because if I don't get any encounter results, that means uh, it will be quite easy to deal with the wizard if I win the initiative, of course. There is a 33% chances of getting an encounter result, but I didn't get it. So I'm being quite lucky in this game. We're going to place the sorcerer. He's going to use a red base because of his level. I pay for it. And the dark player is left with eight points. Point. So I place the sorcerer here according to the rules. He is not the leader, so there is not a special placing for him. We're going to roll for the initiative and see what happens. I will roll for Aki first. And wow, that's a very high roll. So it means we're probably going to win the initiative. Now I'll roll for the Sorcerer. It wasn't a bad roll, but he loses the initiative. Now you will see what happens when you win the initiative again uh, against a Sorcerer who is alone. So I got a 6 and a 4, and that means I will be able to apply the rule caught by surprise. This sorcerer is not really an advanced sorcerer. Most of them have intelligence 5, but the outlaw sorcerer has intelligence 4. Since I got results which were higher than my enemy's intelligence in each of the dice, I can apply the rule caught by surprise. So I can change my enemy's facing and I can push him one square. I'm not going to push him so it's easier for the dwarf to reach him but I'm going to change his facing so that he looks backwards. The numbering in the SND shows which part is the back. Let's see what happens. In this case we should check the spells the sorcerer is going to use but he's probably going to die before even he's able to activate we should check the uh, sorcerer's profile get the bestiary and it reads that he gets three random spells from one random lore among the ones he can choose from fire earth channeling animism witchcraft but he can never get superior spells. So we should get the spell deck. Here it is. And then we would simply choose one lore, one random lore among the ones he can learn spells from. But we're not going to do it now because it's quite likely that he will die before he's able to cast 
one single spell. Okay, I'm going to start with Aki. She's going to move here. Remember that when you move through a door, you can't move diagonally. So one, two, I engage the sorcerer. I roll to hit. Oh, what a roll. That's a critical failure. It's really a disaster, but luckily enough, Aki has the skill Ambush. That rule says that you get a plus one to your initiative rule, to your initiative rolls, and that if you win the initiative, you can repeat your first roll to hit if it was failed. You can do this even if you got a critical failure. So I'm going to re-roll and try to hit again. That's much better. I get an 8 plus 5 for my combat skill. Makes a total result of 13 plus 1 because I'm attacking from the back. Makes a total of 14. The sorcerer rolls to defend and he loses the combat. Aki has strength 3 and she's using a scimitar which gives her 2 extra damage dice. 5 damage dice and I need 3s. And I deal 4 boons to the sorcerer. Which means the sorcerer is left with 1 boon and the condition wounded. Well, we have been very lucky here. If the sorcerer had won the initiative, he could have, for example, uh, spells from the uh, fire lore. And he could have cast a fireball on us, which is a very powerful spell. Or maybe we could have got a result of two encounter cards instead of one. So the sorcerer would be protected by other warriors. But well, we were quite lucky. I'm going to move the dwarf now to engage the sorcerer. I roll to hit and get a six. It's not a very high roll. Six plus four for his combat skill. Plus one for attacking from the back. Minus one for using a battle axe. And then the sorcerer is going to roll to defend. He gets a seven. Plus three for his combat skill makes ten. So the sorcerer gets the same result as the dwarf, but he has a higher agility, which means the sorcerer wins the combat. So it's a new turn for the dark player, and we're going to activate the sorcerer. The dark player gets one more achievement point. And now we have to check what the sorcerer is going to do. Because we can't decide it because we're playing with an artificial dark player. So we check the sorcerer's profile. And it reads that he's going to use the profile spellcaster. Apart from the general rules that the artificial dark player is going to use, he's going to do what this card says. The card says that if a spellcaster is engaged at the beginning of his activation, he must always try to disengage. So he needs to pass an agility test. He needed a 7, and that means he couldn't get it. That was bad luck. If he had managed to disengage, he would have been able to cast a spell after moving away from the heroes. Then uh, we should have rolled one die according to his behavior card, in this case a six, and it would have been a projectile, control, or uh, an offensive spell. But well, anyway, he didn't get it, so we were quite lucky again. Um, in this case, the sorcerer didn't manage to disengage from my heroes. So he has to attack. The general rule says he must always try to hit the easier to hit. He gets a 6 plus 3 for his combat skill minus 1 because he's wounded. That makes a total of 8. The dwarf gets a 6 plus 4 for his combat skill minus 1 for using a battle axe. He wins the roll. Well, this is important. I should have rolled 
there's an area there at the beginning of the sorcerer's activation to see if we got a power result, but uh, we didn't get it, so that was lucky for me. Now it's my hero's turn again. Aki's going to attack. That's a double critical. The sorcerer rolls to defend, but he's not going to get it. Aki has lethal blow. That means with a critical, she manages to reduce the enemy's armor in one. I need twos, and this is not a very good roll, but it is certainly enough. And that's the end of the sorcerer. So the heroes get three achievement points because they have killed a champion level character. Remember, with the red base. And that's it. I can still move Aki since she hadn't moved. We are in exploring turn right now. No traps can be placed on the board. Uh, so you must remember that as soon as there are no enemies, an exploring turn starts. So end of the turn, the dark player gets one more achievement point. I move Aki here and she will try to open the door. No traps again, that was quite lucky. We always advise you to remove the tiles of already explored sections. It will be much more comfortable and it will require less space. I'm going to slightly change the map of this mission so I don't spoil it to um, the players who bought the game. And I'll place this corridor with a door there. Okay, I roll the scenario die to see if there are any enemies. No encounter. So I can move the dwarf mercenary. I move there and, well, I made a mistake. I got out of Aki's safety zone. And that means that uh, there could be a trap. And there is one. As soon as he got out of Aki's safety zone, he triggered a trap. Well, so um, we have to draw a card from the obstacles deck. And here we got the card um, distraction. And the card is the hero must pass a perception test with a minus two penalty. If he does, the trap is negated. If he fails, he takes three damage dice as he is damaged by several blades. This trap can be activated in chests, doors, corridors, or rooms. So uh, it can be used. We're going to try to pass a perception test. Characters usually have no uh, bonuses for perception, most of them. And sometimes perception is modified by either equipment or different skills. In this case, the dwarf has a minus one because he's using heavy armor. And that means I uh, don't need a 10, but an 11. And on the other hand, it must be passed with a minus two, so I don't make it. So I must roll three damage dice. And wow, I needed fives and I got a five and a six, and that means two boons. So the dwarf has paid quite dearly for the mistake he made. I always advise you to avoid rectifying. If you made a mistake, you must pay uh, the consequences because uh, the tension through uh, both through exploring and the combat is going to uh, make you be vigilant. And now I'm going to move uh, Aki. I place the trap here and by the way, I must pay for it. It has a cost of two. And now I will activate Aki. I place her here. I roll to see if there is a trap. No trap. So we open the door and let's see what's beyond. 
we reveal a new section with a door at the end of it. We must roll the scenario die to see if there are any enemies. No enemies spotted. The room is empty. We're going to advance. Now I'm going to activate the dwarf. I'll try to run. One, two, three, four, five. But I was very careful this time not to get out of Aki's melee zone. We should be careful because he already has two wounds. I move the dwarf here and then I move Aki to the door. I roll the scenario die, no traps. Let's see what happens. We place this new room with a large door at its further end. Uh, we roll the scenario die and this time we have a problem. We got a result of encounter. So we must draw a card from the encounter deck. And in this case, we get a card of enemy spotted. We must spend its cost, six points, which means the artificial dark player runs out of budget. And we must use the creature spawn table So I get a five and let's see what enemies we get. Two dwarven bandits with a battle axe, one human bandit with an arquebus and a broadsword. This is gonna get complex. And two rat folk bandits with short sword and a sling. I will show you now how to place uh, the enemies on the board when using an artificial dark player. Here we got our five enemies. The human is equipped with an archibus, uh, which means one extra value point. So he has the most value points from all the party of enemies. Then the two dwarves have a battle axe and the two rat folks, they have a sling and that means they're going to use the range fighter behavior. That's their profile. So let's see how we should place them. Here we have the card with the rules about the way in which enemies are placed when using an artificial dark player. First, we should place the ones with long range weapons. We have none. Secondly, those who can't perform any range attacks because they only have melee weapons. We will keep the one with the most value points for the end. And we will start with the dwarves. One dwarf here, three squares away from the hero who opened the door. Now we will place the second dwarf to the right of the other hero, always following a checkboard pattern. Now we come with a ranged um, fighter enemies. And finally, the one with the most BPs. If this section were a large room, creatures couldn't be adjacent to any others, and we would move them one row backwards. So this is the way in which we must spawn our enemies if we are playing with an artificial dark player with that uh, very characteristic checkboard pattern. The dark player has no budget left, but even though it's going to be terribly difficult to deal with five enemies, being only one hero and a mercenary. There are three different kinds of encounters. Um, you have the card of a uh, wandering creature, that means only one or two creatures. Special creature, 
uh, it might spawn a very powerful creature, but if you win the initiative, it is only one. However, with your card enemy spotted, they usually have the advantage of being more than you. So I roll initiative, 7 for Aki. And now I will roll for the dwarf. You always roll initiative for the dwarf who's closer to the hero who revealed the section. They get a 7. Aki has a plus 1 for the skill Ambush. And another plus 1 for Sharp Senses which means uh, the heroes win the initiative and they will start activating. Before you start the combat, you must always spend a few seconds to see what are your chances and how you are going to approach the combat. You should check through your equipment and see what you've got. A good thing is that the dwarves have neither heavy armor nor a shield and my scimitar can be uh, very dangerous. But I'm quite concerned about this guy with the Archibus. So I will move Aki right in the middle of danger. But uh, before that I have an heroic potion. I have to do it before I move, an heroic potion, I move there, an heroic potion gives you one extra action for this turn and the following one. Okay, I'm going to attack the dwarf, I get an 8 plus 5 for my combat skill 13 and the dwarf gets a 7 plus 4 of his combat skill, that means I win the combat. It's going to be 5 damage dice because I can enjoy the 2 extra damage die of my damage dice of my scimitar. And I get 4 boons. I don't manage to kill the dwarf. But, uh, they are quite tough. They have uh, vitality 5. But I manage to leave him wounded. I push him and follow. And I'm going to attack now the human with the Archibus, which is my main concern. So I roll to hit the human with the Archibus. I get a 7 plus 5 for my combat skill makes 12 and the human rolls 5. So he loses the combat. I got a critical hit, which means 5 damage dice plus the one of the critical hit. And I reduce the human's armor in one because of my skill Lethal Blow. He was wearing no armor, so his armor, his natural armor, is reduced to two. I get all these wounds and he's not knocked out. This was important because this guy was really, really dangerous. I activate the dwarf, one, two. Who shall I attack? Maybe I will focus on the dwarf. Yeah, I'm going to try and finish finish off the dwarf. I get one achievement point for killing one of the bandits. I roll to hit, I get a four, plus four for my combat skill, minus one for using a battle axe. And then the dwarf gets a much worse roll. He was wounded, which meant the minus one. So I roll five damage dice and I get many wounds and the dwarf dies. I get one more achievement point for killing this other enemy. It's time for the Dark Player's turn. We have a new turn for the Dark Player. We roll the scenario die and we get no power result. This is important. So uh, the Dark Player can activate a reinforcement card or upgrade the enemies. We will activate first the range uh, fighters according to the rules. This rat folk here must move in order to have line of sight to one of my characters. He will always move uh, three or less squares away from a hero, so there are no penalties for range. He's going to shoot at Aki. The general rules say mm -hmm. that 
um, the character that has to be chosen as a target is the one which is going to be easiest to hit. And in case of a draw, the one with the lowest armor. So in this case, he's going to uh, choose Aki as a target. He gets a very bad result. So he misses. But on the other hand, he got a one in one of the dice. There is uh, an ally uh, adjacent to the target. And so he hits his ally. He needs fours. And that's very good. Two boons. This is also... Very good news because the rat folk are very agile but they have a very low vitality. He has one vitality and is wounded. I will activate the dwarf next. He's going to attack the one which is uh, easiest to hit. This is not Aki but the dwarven mercenary. I move four spaces here. Um, I roll a very bad result, so I was quite lucky. I will roll for my Dwarf. He doesn't defend too well, but his roll is better than that of his enemy. This is not an attack from the back, because the Dwarf's movement didn't start it at the back of my Dwarf. So that's the end of the turn. Very, very bad turn for the Dark player. I was very lucky. By the way, I have to keep track of the achievement points because uh, I have another turn for the Dark player. One more achievement point for him. It's my turn again. I will still benefit from the heroic potion I have. This is the second and last turn. What shall I do? I think I'll activate my mercenary first. Um, who shall I attack? Uh, okay, I'm going to attack the enemy dwarf. I changed my facing and I will try. I rolled to heat. I got a six plus four for my combat skill, minus one for using a battle axe. But uh, the enemy dwarf gets a better roll and wins the combat. Okay, her first attack is going to be against a rat folk. Eight. Against a 6, he is an arm because he is using a ranged weapon. I win the combat. I got a critical hit. That means one extra die. And well, I only needed one boon, so that's more than enough. And I kill the rat folk. One more achievement point for the heroes. And now I'm going to move to engage the other rat folk. I can do so because the enemy dwarf is already engaged my, by my mercenary. Uh, this rat folk can't perform a defensive shot because I'm too close to him, less than three squares away. So I roll to hit. I get an eight with a critical hit. Uh, the rat folk rolls to defend. He gets a critical failure. He drops. His weapon, the sling, it doesn't break, but I place it below my hero. And then I roll for damage. I even got a critical hit, so it's uh, six dice. Mm -hmm. I reduce armor to threes because of a uh, lethal blow, and he dies. One more achievement point. So I occupy the empty space and change my facing with Aki. One new turn for the Dark player. One more achievement point. We are somehow even. Uh, when you defeat the leader, you get many achievement points, so we could win. Okay, so I get a result of power. If it is a reinforcement card, things are gonna get quite difficult. So I take a card and, well, it's a fortune, fortune card. So the creature has a fortune point. This is not that bad, especially because we're not dealing with the leader yet. So the dwarf is 
going to attack my Dwarven Mercenary. He rolls to hit, gets a 7. Makes a total of 10, plus 4 for his combat skill, minus 1 for using a Battle Axe. And my Mercenary gets a 7, plus 4 for the combat skill, minus 1 for using a Battle Axe. Then it's a draw and we must check their agility. But in this case, the Dwarven Bandit is using uh, Light Armor and is more agile, so he manages to hit me. He reduces my armor in one because he's using a battle axe and oof, two boons. That leaves me with one vitality left and with the condition wounded. If you check the behavior card, it reads that whenever a creature wins a combat, he always pushes and occupies the empty space. This is the end of the Dark Place turn, and it's a new turn for the heroes. Um, I think I'm going to move Aki here, so I engage the dwarf, so that my own dwarf can escape from this situation. So the dwarf defends perfectly, and I don't manage to hit. And now my dwarven mercenary is going to run away. He can do so because my enemy is already engaged by Aki. New turn for the Dark player, one more achievement point. I roll the scenario die, no powers result. And the Dwarf attacks Aki. Wow, that was a very good result with a critical hit. So, how am I going to get away from this? He's going to roll 6 damage dice using his battle axe, uh, 5 and plus 1 for the critical hit. Maybe it's the right time to spend 1 for 2 point. If you have a look at the rulebook, you will see the different ways in which a 14 point can be spent. You can use it to uh, prevent the condition knocked out. But you can also use it to re-roll your last roll or to force your enemy to re-roll his last roll. In this case, that would probably be the best option. However, before I do so, I'm going to roll to defend. To see if it's worth spending the fortune point this way. Ah, that was a very bad result. Even if I make the dwarf re-roll his uh, roll to heat, he's going to win the combat. So I'm going to use my fortune point to prevent the condition knocked out. The dwarf rolls six dice and well. I was quite lucky. He only gets two wounds. He needed threes. Two wounds. One more boon would have left me wounded. So I don't even need to use a fortune point. A new turn for the heroes. I'm going to try to hit the dwarf again. I roll a seven plus five for my combat skill makes twelve. The Dwarf Defense gets an 8, plus 4 for his combat skill, minus 1 for using a Battle Axe, which means I win. 5 damage dice since he's, since he's wearing no shield or heavy armor, and very good result. I get uh, 5 boons. I'm being really lucky this game. 5 boons, and I kill a Dwarf with a single blow. I'm going to spend 1 action in using my healing herbs, I must roll 1d3, well, I get a 2, which equals to a 1, I only heal 1 boon. And then I'm going to use a quick action to give the dwarf a healing potion. He drinks it and restores all his vitality points. I need the dwarf, it's really important. This is the end of the hero's turn. A new turn for the Dark player, who gets one more achievement points and slowly increases 
the number of achievement points. It's my turn again. And I'm going to spend my action in searching corpses. We have six corpses there, grant level. So I get yes. three yeah. coins. Coins are going to become very important when uh, we travel around the map in between quests and we are able to purchase new equipment or resting at inns. That's what we are going to need the coins for. So I have spent my activation for this. I moved the dwarf, but Aki can still move and she's going to move to the door even if she is not going to be able to open it this turn. That's the end of it. One more achievement for the turn of the dark player. I'm going to open the door. Let's see if there is a trap. No trap. So I advance to this exploration arrow. Again, let's see if there is a trap. No trap. So I reveal the next section, which is a corridor. We remove the exploration arrows. And here we found a pit. This is going to be a problem, especially for my mercenary. It might also be a problem for me, but I have some rope among my equipment, so I will jump first. Oh, that was a disaster. I'm going to repeat the roll using one fortune point. I have agility 3, that means I only need a 7, so it's a good idea to spend my fortune. Otherwise, I would fall into the pit and I would get 4 damage dice against my natural armor. I spent the fortune point and let's see what would have happened if I hadn't used my fortune. Let's roll and see what would have happened. Well, only 2 boons, but that would be bad news anyway because I would be left with one vitality point wounded and I have nothing left in my equipment to heal myself. So this was a very good use of a fortune point. Aki changes facing, but now we have a new problem. The thing is that the dwarf was left behind, so now he's going to move, but he's out of Aki's safety zone. So I must roll the scenario die and see if there is a trap. We were very lucky, there was no trap. So the dwarf's going to continue moving to the edge of the pit. Next turn for the dark player, one more achievement point. This is a trap that doesn't have to be detected since it is fixed in the scenario. If it comes out in a card, it has to be detected. So it's the hero's turn again. Aki uses her action to take the rope and help the mercenary in case he fails his jump. So the dwarf is going to try to jump. And he fails. He has a very low agility and got a very low result. And now he will fall into the pit unless Aki is able to help him with the rope. She must pass a strength test, so she needs a 7. She rolls and she makes it. She helps uh, the dwarf. She can reuse her rope later. With a result of a critical failure, it would have been broken. So the mercenary manages to overcome the obstacle. Remember that I lost one fortune point. I got two left. Next turn for the dark player. One more achievement point. He already has 18. Okay, so if we were using the mobile app, we could see that this door is a locked door. This was already part of the scenario, so it comes at no cost for the dark player. It can be activated for free. I got a problem now. Aki is very good at detecting traps and winning the initiative, but she's not especially good at disarming traps or opening locked doors. So I'm going to need a result of 10 and I have no bonuses whatsoever, so I roll and I didn't get it. 
This means I haven't been able to open this door stealthily and I have to break it down. So Aki's activation has finished, but I still can activate my dwarf. He's going to try to break down the door. He gets automatic hits and it's a good thing that he's using a battle axe because he reduces the door's armor to four, which means I will need less turns to break it down. So I get three boons. Average doors have uh, vitality 5, armor 5. Reinforced doors have vitality 6, armor 6. This is an average one, so it will be easier. So this is the first turn I have spent on breaking down the door. I will place a token here to remember that. Turn for the dark player, one more achievement point, and it's the hero's turn again. So we have to go on trying to break down the door. The dwarf rolls and he gets two boons, which is exactly what we needed to finish in smashing the door. We have needed two turns, you will see later this is important. Then we managed to break down the door, so we regarded it as open. We reveal the new room and all the enemies spawn inside this room will get a bonus to their initiative equal to the number of turns it took the heroes to break down the door. They needed two turns, that means they have a plus two to their initiative. The enemies have a plus two to their initiative. The dark player didn't draw any cards which could be discarded and that means he didn't get any extra reserve points. We were lucky with this because that means the dark player can only place the leader here in the final room. And the leader is not going to be accompanied by any other enemies. If the dark player had some reserve points left, he could use some uh, enemies cards, but he doesn't have any. If we were playing with more heroes, more than one hero as we're doing now, we would probably have more encounter cards in our encounter deck. So there would be probably more creatures accompanying the leader. Um, we would probably have one more encounter card for sure. Even with two heroes, things would probably be much more difficult. However, we were quite lucky. We have uh, the leader alone and even if the leader wins the initiative because he gets that extra plus two to his initiative because we broke down the door we have no enemies close to us and he's quite far away so let's see what happens Let's roll initiative. We'll roll for Aki. She gets a six plus two for her bonuses. That makes eight. And now we will roll for Roar. He gets a nine plus two for the bonus the heroes gave him by breaking down the door. If we check Rock's profile, we can see he's equipped with chainmail, shield, and a broadsword. Well, the chainmail gives him a penalty of a minus one to perception, but even though Roar wins the initiative. So, you must check the leader behavior card. And it reads that he can learn new skills by uh, rolling three dice. And then he can learn new skills with a cost equal to each of the results you roll. In this case, skills for a cost of two, four, and six points. But it's not, it's not the case because we don't have any budget left. So Roar is going to move towards the heroes, but he doesn't reach them yet. One more achievement point for the dark player. He has a total of 20 achievement points. Before Roar moves, we must roll the 
uh, scenario there to see if we get a powers result. If we had got a powers result, that would mean reinforcements or upgrades for Roar. We'll continue with the final combat against Roar, the leader of this scenario. You must remember that once the heroes enter the final room, they can still get more achievement points for defeating the leader, for finding special elements or disarming traps. However, the dark player doesn't get any more achievement points once the leaders enter the final room. Going to start with Aki, she rolls to hit Roar. Roar is very similar to Aki in his stats. She gets a 6 plus 5 for her combat skill, makes an 11. Roar gets exactly the same result. Roar and Aki have exactly the same agility, so we have a second draw. And in order to break this draw, we must remember that Roar is wearing a shield. So he wins the combat, and because he's wearing a shield, he can, he can push Aki one square backwards. Now we're going to try with our Dwarf. He gets an 8, plus 4 for his combat skill, minus 1 because he's using a um, Battle Axe. Roar gets a 7, plus 5, that makes 12. So he wins the combat again and pushes the Dwarf back. A new turn for the Dark player. First of all, we must roll the scenario die to see if we get a powers result. And yes, that's a powers result. So we must take one card, reinforcements. Well, this would be quite dangerous because we would have to place uh, some enemies at the back of this corridor. And even if there is the keep as an obstacle for them, but it would be quite dangerous. However, we can't activate this card because the dark player doesn't have any budget left. So the card is discarded and then the dark player gets six new uh, reserve points. This means we should kill the leader quickly, otherwise he will be probably upgraded. So the leader attacks the easier to hit, who is the dwarf. The Dwarf gets a 6, plus 4 for his combat skill, minus 1 for using a Battle Axe, a total of 9. But he is less agile than Roar, and that means Roar wins the roll. He's got a Strength of 4, plus 1 for the Broadsword, and he needs 5, which is the Dwarf's armor. Only one boon for the Dwarf. We were lucky here too. It's the Hero's turn now. You must remember that... If the hero side have three heroes, the leader would get one extra action. With four or more, he or more heroes, the leader gets two extra actions. So Aki moves here. This is not an attack from the back because he didn't, she didn't start uh, her movement from the back of Roar. She should have started her movement from Roar's back, but this wasn't the case. However, it will be a tactical advantage in forthcoming turns. Aki gets a 6 and Rourke defends very well. She pushes Aki back. Rourke can use his shield to push Aki. But you must remember you can't use shields when you are attacked from the back, which wasn't the case. So the... Dwarven Mercenary attacks Rourke, it's a good roll, but Rourke gets uh, to win the Dwarf and he pushes the Dwarf back and follows. It's a new turn for the Dark player, Rourke attacks, he gets a very good roll, but we must also roll the scenario die to see if we get a powers result. It's not the case. So Rourke has this roll to hit, makes a total of 15 with his combat skill of 5. The dwarf defends, but it's not enough. So Rourke wins the combat. He's going to roll 5 damage dice plus 1 for the critical hit. And the dwarf was extremely fortunate because 
he wasn't wounded. Roar pushes the dwarf back. If he goes on like this, he will be able to push the dwarf into the pit. And a new turn for the heroes comes. Aki moves to attack Roar. She gets a 7, plus 5 makes 12. Roar gets 8. This time, Aki is attacking from the back. Roar has an 8, plus 5 makes 13. However, Aki has a plus 1 because she is attacking from the back. <clears throat> this is a draw. They both get a total of 13. They both have the same agility. And Roar has a shield, but he cannot use it because he's been attacked from his back. So we have a triple draw, but in these cases, the defender always wins the combat. The dwarf attacks Roar now. He gets a 7. Roar loses the combat. So the dwarf is going to deal 5 damage dice, 3 for his strength plus 2 for the battle axe he's using. He needed fours, and he gets one boon. Let's place one boon next to Roar to remember that. And it's Roar's turn again. He's going to keep focusing on the dwarf. Wow, that was a very good roll. But before that, we must roll this scenario die, and yes, we got a powers result. We're going to keep this roll, and we will draw one card from the powers deck. Healing. In this case, the leader can heal 1d3 plus 1 vitality point. So we don't even need to roll. We're going to pay for the car 2 points. And Roar recovers that only one he had. Roar has a very good roll to hit. The roll defense, but he doesn't get it. Roar is going to roll... His usual five dice, four for his strength, one for on the for the broadsword, and one for the critical hit. He needs fives, and he deals three boons. That is quite painful. And the dwarf is left with one vitality, and that means he gets the condition disease, getting a minus one to all his attributes. Roar pushes the dwarf and follows. And it's a new turn for the heroes. Even if Aki moves to engage Roar, the dwarf can't really find a place where he could escape. So he will have to fight. I move Aki here. I get a very good roll to hit. A 10. Roar defends, but he loses the combat. So... Aki is going to roll three dice for her strength, plus one for the critical hit. That makes four damage dice, and she needs fours thanks to the lethal blow. She deals two boons, which is not bad. So Aki pushes and follows. But, um, wait, I'm going to do something different. Instead of pushing the dwarf there, I'm going to push him next to the pit. If we were lucky enough, we could push him into the pit. So the dwarf is going to attack Roar. He rolls to hit, gets an 8, plus 4 for his combat skill, makes 12, minus 1 for the battle axe, minus 1 because he's wounded, and Roar gets a... Critical fate. We're probably going to see how Roar falls into the pit. First of all, we're going to roll for damage. Five dice, I need fours. Only one boon. But it doesn't really matter because the dwarf pushes Roar into the pit. Roar falls. And that means four damage dice against natural armor. All fours deal damage against natural armor. He's got a natural armor of three, three new boons, and that means the scenario leader has been knocked out. After falling into the pit. 
but we're not going to roll the scenario die for powers anymore because the combat is over. This was a very good result for the heroes. And now let's see how many achievement points they get. First of all, they have killed a champion level warrior. They had 8, that makes 11. Well, let me check. No, they didn't have nine achievement po 8 achievement points. They had 9, which makes 12, and 3 extra points for uh, killing the leader. Um, the Dark Players still has more achievement points. We could explore the rest of the scenario, but we should be careful now because the Dark Player still has some reserve points and things could get more complex. So Aki is going to move, but she's going to stop there within the Dwarf's safety zone because the Dark Player can still activate more traps. So the Dwarf follows and it's the next turn for the Dark Player. He doesn't get any more achievement points and I can move the heroes always within each other's safety zone to get to the chest. So Aki is going to try to open the chest. We first must roll the scenario die and there is a trap. The trap is flares. This trap can be easily detected. We only need an eight. Aki has a plus one because of sharp senses. So yes, she detects the trap, but that won't be enough if she wants to get the contents inside the chest. In order to do so, she needs to disarm the trap. Of course, she can also go away and forget about the chest. But if she wants to open it, she will try to disarm it. And we're going to try. We don't get it, which means we must apply the contents of the card. Each character located in the section is hit by a flare from the ground. They deal three fire damage dice each. This card can be used in chests, doors, corridors, and rooms. So three damage dice, first for the dwarf. Uh, well, I roll the wrong die, so I re-roll. And three boons, sorry, th two boons. Well, that means uh, the dwarf gets two more boons and is knocked out. Now let's see what happens to Aki. Well, only one more boon, but she manages to open the chest. Now we must draw one card from the treasure deck. Let's see what she gets. In this case, eight coins and one random common object. So we take the three coins. We can also simply note them down and we should draw one card from the common object deck. From this moment on, Aki has to decide whether she wants to go on exploring. She can search for secret doors and see some unrevealed sections in which she could find new special elements, new treasures. But in that case, the Dark Player will be able to activate new traps with the budget he has left. On the other hand, she can simply uh, get away from the scenario, always moving two squares to keep herself within her own safety zones. This depends on what the players wish to do. If Aki chooses to get away from the scenario, she is not going to be affected by any more traps since the dark player won't be able to trigger them. However, she will still have to overcome the pit. In this case, she would get a critical failure. That means she would fall into the pit. She might even die. Well, she would probably spend one more fortune point to reroll. And yes, she would manage to overcome the pit. There are no more obstacles like this in this scenario. So she should be able to uh, cautiously move away from this scenario. 
the dwarf attacks Rourke. He got a 5 in his roll, plus 4 for his combat skill, minus 1 because he's using a battle axe. That makes a total of 8. Rourke defends, he gets a 5, plus a 5 for his combat skill, makes a total of 10. So Rourke wins the combat. It is Rourke's turn. He's going to attack the easier to hit. In this case, it is the dwarf. He gets a 10 with a critical hit. That makes a total of 15. So the dwarf is going to try to defend, but he doesn't get it. So Roar will roll for damage. That's four dice for his strength, one for the broadsword, one for the critical, and the dwarf doesn't have a shield. So this is the result for boons. And that means the dwarf is knocked down. He already had two boons, so that's the end of the dwarf. Now Aki is going to have to deal with Rourke on her own. Well, before his turn ends, Rourke is going to occupy the dwarf's fallen space and he's going to change his facing towards Aki. So Aki tries to attack Rourke. She gets a 7. This is not a bad roll. Plus 5 for her, for her combat skill, that makes a 12. Rourke defends, but he gets an 8. Plus 5 for his combat skill, 13. He wins the combat. Uh, Rourke attacks Aki. Aki defends with a 4. She loses the combat, but she's going to try to block with her shield. And she needed a 5, she gets a 6. She needed a 5+. plus. And Roar manages to hit, that's 5 damage dice and the critical, and that is enough to knock Aki out. And this is it. During the next turn, if she had survived, let's see what power could Roar get, in this case fear. So Aki would have had to overcome a uh, fear, a courage test. In the next one, Roar would have got a fortune point. And the last one, well, this card is very powerful, outstanding warrior. And that means that Roar gets a plus one to his strength and combat skill. This combat would be really, really difficult for Aki. Well, that's all. I hope you liked the video. You can see that our hero has fallen in the end. There was a moment in which when Aki was able to block uh, Rourke's hit, if she had chosen to push him, she might have taken advantage to flee.